Okay, so we talked about uh, reactions and how we um, express the conditions. And we want to look at next, uh, how does a reaction occur? Let's say we have such a same machine. Uh, we have a input signal X, which takes uh, values present, absent. So it's a, a pure signal. The output is Y, uh, also takes two possible values uh, as itself is also a pure signal. And we have two states, S1 and S2. S1 is the initial state. And we have a transition from S1 to S2. And we have a label uh, X forward slash Y. So what we're saying here is um, we want to use uh, the label on the uh, arrow to uh, define what will be the condition, condition for this transition and what will be the actions uh, taken while we do the transition. In this case, uh, all the inputs are discrete and a reaction uh, occurs when any input is present. So regardless how you, or what you put as predicates as the guard, uh, so this, um, you know, this part before the forward slash symbol, uh, if any of these uh, input signals uh, is present, uh, this um, reaction will occur. Reaction will cause this predicates to be evaluated. So if X is present, uh, we'll evaluate this condition. Uh, and because we say uh, X, uh, that is to say, if X is present, uh, this transition is enabled. So we'll take this transition from state S1 uh, to S2. And because of that, we also uh, output uh, Y as present. Uh, this is called event trigger model. So what we're saying here is um, X is present, which means that uh, there's an event uh, on this input signal X. Uh, so it's present. Uh, and as a result, this transition will take place. And consequently, the output action will be taken. And that means we're going to output present on the signal Y. Okay. Again, this is the event triggered model. Now let's look at a very similar uh, state machine, uh, almost the same, except that in this case, uh, on this uh, um, arrow, the label is not X uh, forward slash Y. The question here, well, let's suppose X, Y, again, discrete and pure signals. Uh, when does this transition occur? Uh, when X is absent. Okay. Any uh, other um, comments? The current state is S1. Oh. Yes, the current state is S1. So let's look at this interesting example. Uh, what are the input signals? X, right? We only have one input signal. Um, we will um, if you look at this predicate, the um, not X, uh, you know, from our um, earlier slides, we know that um, this is to say, uh, if X is absent, uh, this condition is going to be true, right? So ideally, we ex expect that this transition will be taken. But here's the issue. The issue is um, the system, the reaction 
only occurs when any of the input signal is present. Let me say that again. So the reaction occurs when any of the input signal is present. That is to say, uh, if X is absent, we basically will not evaluate this. And because we only have one input signal, and if the X, this input signal is absent, uh, we will not have this reaction. As a result, this guard, this predicate part will not be evaluated at all. So this transition will not happen. So I think this is a little bit um, um, tricky to understand if you just look at this finite state machine. Um, because the way we designed this state machine, we use the event triggered model. Uh, and in particular, in this example, we are saying that um, we're gonna be, the, the condition will be X is absent. Um, th this, in this case, uh, because the input signal is absent, this reaction will not be triggered, will not occur. So it will not evaluate uh, the predicate. As a result, uh, it will be you know, not taking this transition. If you think about a more concrete example, uh, if, you're, if you don't have changes on the input signal, if you don't have changes, uh, if there's no car arriving, and then your system state will not change because your, your input signal uh, is absent, right? Okay, so we look at, in the previous two slides, uh, two very similar uh, finite state machines. Their inputs are the same. There's only one input signal X, uh, and there's only one output signal Y, uh, and all, both X and Y are pure signals, which means that they take value either present or absent. Uh, the transition diagram is a little bit different. Uh, the predicate, the condition is, this case is, uh, X is present, and in this case is X is absent. Now, one thing we assume differently here is that suppose all the inputs are uh, discrete and a reaction occurs on the tick of an external clock. So although it's not drawn here, but we assume there's an external clock, external clock, which will uh, give you this ticks uh, at certain interval based on the period of the clock. And in such a case, uh, we say this is a time triggered model because the reaction will occur every clock tick. So no matter what you have as the uh, input signal present or absent, this condition, this guard will be evaluated on every um, clock tick. Could be the rising edge, could be the falling edge, uh, but you know, we're gonna be uh, evaluating this um, predicate um, as the guard to decide whether uh, this transition is taken or not, or in this case, whether this transition is taken or not. So it Excuse may me, have- professor. Yes. Uh, are time triggered models more practical in general or just in this instance? Are there cases when event triggered models are more practical or not really? Well, I would say, uh, let me give you one example. If a um, event is very rare, okay, very rare, it makes sense to use a event triggered model because uh, you may you know, have to wasting a lot of energy if you check that uh, condition every clock cycle. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that was a very good question. Uh, but what we want to emphasize in this example here is that uh, 
you know, for time triggered model, uh, it will not, you know, have that case where your predicate was not evaluated. This will be evaluated every cycle. And of course, you know, we're going to be looking at the um, status or the, the value on the pure signal is present or absent. And based on that, we'll take the transition or not taking the transition. Um, professor, um, for an example of time trigger model, what would the uh, traffic light be one of the example? Uh, can you repeat that part? Uh, for time trigger model example, what one of the uh, what the traffic light example uh, be one of the example for a time trigger model? Okay, yeah, very good question. So the traffic light uh, example, um, you you could definitely use a time trigger model uh, to um, um, count the remaining seconds. Of for staying at certain state or, you know, giving out a certain um, lights. Uh, that's a good, you know, case, uh, case, good application to use time trigger model. For that case, you can also use uh, event triggered. Um, well, let me see. Well, because I changed lab one a little bit um, before the start of the semester. Um, in my first initial uh, specification of lab one, uh, I actually, you know, um, asked you to, well, the students to use um, ultrasound sensor to detect the, the presence of the car. Uh, so in that case, uh, a um, event triggered model is also uh, possible. Uh, but for our case, um, time trigger model for the traffic light, you know, you know looking at the time, and uh, that's uh, a practical design. Um, but in terms of the implementation part, uh, which I will talk more later, you could have different ways to um, implement this time trigger model. Um, you can use uh, timer interrupts. Uh, you know, we have not talked about interrupts uh, at this point, so you don't have to use it. Uh, you can use other um, functions like you, you can you know, count the uh, elapse of time in your code and then track that away. Um, but, you know, that's the implementation. But in terms of model, um, time trigger model is uh, appropriate uh, for this um, particular lab assignment. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Okay, default transitions. Um, default transition is enabled if no non-default transition is enabled. Uh, it's no guard or guard evaluate to be true. Uh, so when is the above default transition enabled? If neither of the guards are satisfied. Uh, we actually only one have only one guard, right? This is for a different one. Oh, uh, okay. state coming back to state zero. So you're right. So if this guard is not true, which means that if the up is absent uh, or um, down is present, uh, this can be staying here. Uh, so that one was not shown um, because, um, you know, they they um, they don't produce they they are not um, they don't have guard or produce uh, output or go to other states. We will show default transition if uh, they are guarded or produce outputs or go to another state. Uh, there's example here. Um, you know, we have a default transition. Uh, so if uh, this condition is not true, we'll stay with uh, this uh, red state. 
uh, but we're going to be outputting a signal R. Um, same, similar here, if uh, this condition time G is not true, we're going to uh, stay um, at this state green, uh, but we're going to be outputting a signal G. So that's the case we uh, will show the default transition. Um, so this is the example that where the default transition um, doesn't have to be shown. Um, you know, it's, it's similar to what we saw earlier, but uh, it has only um, you know, fewer transitions um, because those are kind of the default transitions. Um, you can use this example uh, to construct the formal mathematic model. Um, that means we will use those uh, five tuples to um, record the states, inputs, outputs, uh, update function, which means you, know, you, you need to use a mathematical um, description to describe this transition from this, this graphical uh, notation. Okay, we're gonna look at additionally some definitions related to finite state machine. Stuttering transition. Stuttering transition uh, refers to a default transition that is enabled when the inputs are absent, that does not change states, uh, and that produce absent outputs. Receptiveness, um, for any input values, some transition is enabled. Uh, we use this default transitions to ensure that our finite state machines are receptive. Uh, so we will respond to any input values because we have this uh, default transitions defined. Determinism, in every state, for all the input values, uh, exactly uh, one transition is enabled. So we have this uh, uh, many to one mapping. Now, what, the reason I say many to one is uh, it's possible that we um, take you know, multiple input values, they go to the same next state, but you will not see a one to many mapping, uh, which means that for a for the same input value, you will go to a different state or different states. Um, that's the non-deterministic uh, finite st uh, state machine we will, we will see. So we have three kinds of transitions. Um, we talk about the self loop and we talk about the default transitions and just earlier we talked about starter transition. Starter transition. Let me go back a little bit. Uh, just remind you, starter, stuttering transition is the default transition that is enabled when inputs are absent, does not change state, and produce absent outputs. So th let's see if. Um, you can answer any of uh, these questions. Is a default transition always a self loop? Um, yes. Any different opinions? I'm gonna say no. Why is that? Uh, because a default transition is just when none of the other guards are um, really achieved. So I don't see a reason why you can't just have a default that brings you somewhere else. That's correct. So a default transition is not always self-loop. It could be transitioning to another state. A second question, uh, is a starting transition always a self-loop?
You don't want to try it? I'll say uh, yes. That's right. That's uh, by its definition that it, uh, stuttering transition does not change state. So it must be a self loop. Third question is a self loop always stuttering? No. Because? Because uh, it could be stuttering only happens if there's all the inputs are absent and a self loop could have an input. And output. And output, yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go into the um, next few slides about uh, extended state machine. I hope you still remember the first few state machines that we talked about today, uh, the garage uh, you know, car count counting machine where we had uh, M plus one states, right? Um, here, we're trying to do the same thing, but we are um, changing the finite state machine model with variables that may be read and written as part of the taking a transition between states. So let's look at the diagram on the right. We have uh, just one state and it's just counting. And the variables here is the uh, this C, which takes possible values from zero, one, up to M. And the inputs are the same. We have up and down two pure signals. So they could be absent or present. The output is uh, another, uh, well, the output is the same as before the uh, count. And that has a, um, possible values from this set um, 0, 1, up to M. And let's look at these transitions. Uh, the initial state is the counting. So on the uh, first transition, we're going into the initial state we initialize this counter to be zero, this variable C to be zero. And it, uh, it is a self loop uh, because it goes to itself. The guard is uh, up and not down and C less than M. So as you can tell that this is, you know, easy to understand if there is a car going in and no car going out, so this present is absent, uh, and the garage is not full, uh, we're gonna take this transition. Uh, we're gonna stay this same state, but because we have taken this transition, we're gonna be doing a few actions. The action, first action is C plus one. Uh, I'll explain earlier, uh, later why it's C plus one, not C. And also we have another action. This is the set action, which really means that we're gonna be uh, assigning a new value to the variable. And we have variable C, so we're gonna be assigning the original value C plus one to this variable. Okay, and for the counting down is similar. Um, Sorry, I, yeah, let's talk about this one. Um, so in general, what you see, uh, a extended state machine um, has fewer states uh, with the help of uh, you know, more complex actions. In the standard state machines, we have this output action, uh, but now we can have a set action, which will update some of the variables, uh, which you have to declare at the beginning. And uh, you can have this initial set action associated with going into this initial state. And after that, uh, the guard will be checked, the output action will be taken and set action will be taken if the guard uh, is holds. And the reason we have to do C plus one in the previous case is that uh, when you, uh, you know, when the guard is, uh, evaluated and to be true, the output actions uh, 
refer to a variable, we are using the values before the assignment of the set action. So the timing essentially is defined that when you uh, take this action, uh, sorry, when you take the transition and all the values uh, that you use to evaluate or use to calculate in the actions, uh, those variable, the, the values of those variables are the values before the set action, before the assignment of the new values. And that's why if you go back and look at here, uh, we are going to output C plus one because at this point, C is still the original value. And then we assign this C plus one to variable C. Uh, so that then the, the, uh, when this action is taken uh, in the next state, this variable C has the up-to-date counter of the cars. Okay, uh, slightly more complex state machine. This is a traffic light controller, which keeps track of time and um, assuming it reacts at regular time interval. So this is a time triggered model. And this is an extended state machine because we have a variable count and variable um, can have value from zero, one up to 60. The input to the state machine uh, is one pure signal pedestrian and outputs are uh, signal R, G, Y. So those are the control signals for the lights and they're all pure signals. So absent or present. And as you can see that this state machine has four states and initial state is red, and we have um, uh, transitions. Uh, this is the guard, and we have the output action, set action, um, when we go from red to green. And um, default transition, and we're gonna stay here, uh, counting up. Um, so as you can see, this count variable is a uh, variable that we keep track of the time uh, in terms of, I would say seconds, assuming that the clock runs uh, every um, one, one hertz. Uh, so you will have to tick at every second. Okay. Now, this is how we define uh, the um, state machine to control the lights. Uh, and of course, for the inputs, we should have something uh, as a sensor to detect if there's a, a pedestrian present. And it's, um, it's, it's part of the um, design as the input to the system. And it could, you know, change uh, by the environment. So the um, pedestrian uh, could, you know, arriving um, um, any, any time, uh, even between the uh, clock ticks. So uh, it may happen that you, you have a pedestrian arriving uh, even before you, um, you know, uh, counting up the time or resetting the time. Um, so there's uh, uncertainty of this um, input signal in terms of time. We've talked about a lot so far about the state machines. These state machines are deterministic finite state machines. Um, the number of states um, in these state machines could be huge. Uh, with the extended state machines, um, you uh, not only have the information about which uh, discrete state, uh, the bubbles, the circles the, ma the machine has, but also uh, the next state depends on the values of these variables. So even though if you just count the number of states, you may think about, okay, you reduce the number of uh, discrete states, 
but in terms of the transitions, you still have to consider the values uh, of the variables. The numbers of possible states can therefore be quite large or even uh, infinite. If let's say there are n discrete states, these bubbles, and m variables, uh, each of which can have uh, one of the p possible values, then the size of the state space is defined as this. So the number of states in the state machine, if you don't use a extended state machine to represent, that will be uh, n times p uh, to the square of uh, m, uh, to, the, to the power of m. Uh, so it's going to be a very huge uh, number of states uh, if uh, P and M is large. In the next few slides, I want to introduce uh, non-deterministic finite state machine. Um, this is what we have um, kind of complementary to what we saw earlier, the pedestrian um, you know, traffic light control uh, state machine. Here, uh, this is the environment. Um, it's the kind of how we capture the status of the environment in terms of um, how the pedestrian signal, pure signal is um, generated. So in this case, what we have uh, is uh, input signals, pure signals, uh, are uh, red signal, green signal, Y signal. And um, the outputs from this state machine is the pedestrian, which is the pure signal. And the way we design this is we have three states, crossing, none, waiting. And we start with crossing. And if this green uh, signal, uh, we will um, transition to none. Um, basically, we um, will determine that there's, uh, um, there's no pedestrian present. Uh, essentially, you know, the, the crossing is completed. Um, and then from this none, uh, we see uh, there are two uh, transitions possibly. Uh, this circle uh, loop here, and then this transition to the waiting. And what's interesting or unique is that both of these two transitions, their guards are true. So their guards are true. And that means for this uh, state none, when you transit to the next state, there are possibly um, two uh, next states itself or to the waiting. If it's transition to waiting, um, th uh, the output, uh, the action will be uh, output this pedestrian. And uh, if you take this transition, um, the um, output will be nothing. Okay, there would be no output. And this, this pedestrian signal is what we uh, need for the um, control signal, uh, traffic light control signal that we saw in this diagram as the input. Um, so the, the way these two uh, state machine works are uh, uh, very subtle, tricky when it's in terms of the, how the pedestrian uh, pure signal is generated. It has a lot to do with, you know, whether the pedestrian uh, is um, present um, in between the um, time clocks, uh, time ticks or not. Uh, and the environment itself could cause uh, this pedestrian signals to delay. Uh, let's say if the, um, um, if the sensor has some um, unreliable uh, issues uh, or due to weather. Uh, so this, um, this kind of um, non-determinist finite machine 
will give us uh, some flexibility to um, describe these uh, um, these unexpected conditions without worrying too much about uh, exactly what the other um, uh, light control system is at, uh, because the interactions between these two uh, C machines are uh, fairly complex. If you use also here a, finest, a deterministic finite state machine um, to describe uh, based on what you have uh, uh, in terms of control signals and the time counters, you know, 20 seconds or 30 seconds, um, the number of states will, will explode. So it's better off to use this non-deterministic finite machine to um, basically, you know, capture these fail safe conditions and then uh, make this transition next um, time. So the, um, I explained earlier that one of the reasons we want to use this nine uh, deterministic uh, finite state machines is to model these unknown aspects of the environment or system. Um, you know, if you run a robot uh, and you expect that it goes forward, um, but you know, if there's a bump, the robot may, you know, tip over or uh, slightly divert from its original direction. So these are the environment that could affect the, um, the you know, status or um, signals uh, that uh, you use as input. Also, uh, for cases that you can use uh, this non-determinism to hide the details uh, of the system. And uh, there's a, a more detailed explanation example uh, in the textbook. Um, another reason um, why a non-deterministic finite state machine is preferred over deterministic finite state machine is because of the size of the states. Uh, when we describe finite state machine, we can use uh, graphical notations or mathematical notations but its behavior uh, here where, you know, the finite state machine behavior is a sequence of steps. Um, really uh, what we can um, use um, this diagram, um, well, the, the, the trace is uh, a record of input states and outputs. So uh, we start with the red state and if we have a green signal and then the um, states, uh, it's states change to green. And if we have a yellow signal, it's like change to yellow and so on. So this is a possible trace of the finite state machine. And you can combine every possible trace together. Um, you will see that uh, it forms a computation tree uh, that represents all the possible traces. This kind of representation is useful uh, when you do formal analysis. Uh, formal analysis is a method uh, that can be um, used to validate your model, especially for critical applications. Before you put your design out to the field, you want to make sure that the, de the design you have, the state machine you create uh, will not lead to any uh, unsafe conditions, which could be catastrophic. Um, we mentioned that the size of the uh, finite state machines could be uh, um, you know, exponential uh, if you use uh, deterministic finite state machines. In general, non-deterministic finite state machines are more compact um, you, if you took you know, compiler or um, you know, theory related to automata uh, that you know shows a non-deterministic finite state machine uh, can be equivalent to a deterministic, but with very small state uh, numbers. Um, 
in the worst case, a determinist finite state machine may have uh, exponential numbers of the states of the non-deterministic finite state machine. Um, the sequence of um, the deterministic finite state machine and the non-deterministic finite state machine uh, are very different. A deterministic uh, system exhibits a single behavior because for given input uh, in the current state, you will definitely transition to one uh, next state. Um, and you follow this uh, all the way further. But for non-deterministic finite state machine, uh, you will possibly you know, go to different states um, given the same input value. Um, so that's what we see here. Uh, from here, you know, you may go to these two um, different states, even when you have the same input value on the input signals. Uh, one more thing about non-deterministic. Uh, it's different from probabilistic or stochastic. Uh, in a probabilistic uh, finite state machine, uh, the transition has associated probability with which it's taken. So you know, you know, 50% uh, of chance you go to state one uh, and 50% uh, of chance you go to state two. Uh, that's for the probabilistic finite state machine. For a non-deterministic finite state machine, no such probability is known. So it's, you know, very random. Okay, so in terms of the finite state machine um, dynamic, uh, discrete dynamics, we talk about uh, models and create the state machines. And we talk about actors, uh, input signal, output signal, uh, their types, pure signal and numerical value types. Uh, we talk about a lot on the states, um, transitions and guards. Um, actions. And we also talk about the determinism, uh, receptiveness, and non-deterministic finite state machine.